This is hard to talk about. The Unicorn Clan, I mean. They are a clan that is especially defined by a journey that took place over the course of eight centuries. Covering that exodus in any degree of detail would require this video to be over an hour long, or at least multiple videos at 30 minute length. This is especially awkward because I've already got a schedule in place for the rest of the year, and I'm generally reluctant to alter that schedule. So what I decided to do instead for this introductory kind of video was that I would focus on the Unicorn Clan before and after the Exodus, while saving the journey itself for some future videos. Hopefully you find this explanation slash excuse satisfactory. With that, let's begin. As always, the story of the Unicorn Clan begins with one of the eight kami that fell to Sepun Hill, Shinjo, the only other daughter of the Sun and Moon besides Doji, founder of the Crane Clan. You would be hard-pressed to find two sisters that were more divergent from one another in character. Doji concerned herself principally with things like culture, art, and beauty, while Shinjo was indisputably a tomboy known for both her speed in a fight and her great curiosity. Despite being such polar opposites in terms of personality, the two sisters got along famously. In fact, there was only one sibling with whom Shinjo enjoyed a closer relationship, her brother, Fu Lang. Of course, this was back in the days before Fu Lang fell into Jigoku and became corrupted by its evil. Fu Lang was the only one among her siblings that could make Shinjo laugh, and so the two were practically inseparable. In fact, when their father, the Lord Moon, went mad and started devouring his own children, the two were attempting to hide from him when their brother Togashi, compelled to ensure that the visions of the future that he saw came to pass, exposed all three of them to Onotangu, ensuring that they were all swallowed by him. Of course, eventually, they were all freed by Hante and fell to Earth. Though Shinjo was the first among the siblings to notice that Fu Lang was not with them. Unbeknownst to her at the time, her favorite brother had in fact fallen away from his siblings and had fallen so hard upon the Earth that he had crashed through it and landed in Jigoku, the realm of Hell. When the Kami set out from Sepun Hill for their five-year period of exploration of this new land they'd arrived in, Shinjo spent the entire time searching for Fu Lang, but alas, found no sign of him. When the five years expired, Shinjo rejoined her siblings at Sepun Hill and took part in the Tournament of the Kami to determine who among them should rule their newfound empire of Rokugan. Shinjo made it past the first round, successfully countering her brother Hida's greater strength with her superior speed, only to lose in the second round against her cunning brother Bayushi. When the tournament was concluded and Hante was acknowledged as the first emperor of Rokugan, he began assigning lands within the new empire to his siblings. To Shinjo, he gave the lands of the northwest, a country of open plains and rolling hills. To the east lay the mountainous home of the Dragon Clan. To the southeast, the lands of the Lion. To the direct south were the Spine of the World mountain range and the great mystical forest of Shinomen Mori, which separated the land of the Unicorn from the territories of the Scorpion and Crab clans. Like her siblings, Shinjo adopted a Mon, or crest, to symbolize the great clan that she was to found. Originally in those days, she chose as her sign the Kirin, which is basically just the Japanese rendering of Chilin, a monster from Chinese mythology. A Kirin essentially has the head and scales of a Chinese dragon, but instead of the long serpentine body typical of such creatures, its body has the stocky build and hooves of an ox. As mythical creatures go, the Kirin is a fairly obscure one. The only myths concerning it say that it appears as a great omen, usually foretelling either the birth or impending death of some great and important personage usually a wise sage or illustrious ruler. The Kirin is also sometimes depicted as having one horn, which kind of explains, at least in part, the transition from Kirin to Unicorn Clan later on in the future. And so, with the Kirin Clan formally established, 
Shinjo began looking among the people of the Northwestern Plains for worthy vassals. It took a while, but finally, in the year 31, two years prior to the war with Fu Lang, Shinjo at last found her lieutenants, a husband and wife named Ide and Otaku. Ide was cunning and a skilled negotiator. Thus, whenever Shinjo needed a representative for her interests and she couldn't attend herself, he was the one that she would send as her ambassador. Otaku, on the other hand, was a warrior to the core. Legend has it that she almost never spoke, that she held herself above all worldly desires and was dedicated solely to Shinjo's protection. For this reason, she quickly became the Kami's right-hand woman. When you think about it, there are actually quite a few parallels between Ide and Otaku and Ikoma and Matsu, the first followers of Akoto. The big difference being that the Kirin clan lieutenants' personalities weren't nearly as extreme as that of their lion counterparts. For instance, Ide was not a larger-than-life hedonistic teller of tall tales like Ikoma, and Otaku was nowhere near as thin-skinned or belligerent as Matsu. Both would serve Shinjo ably and well in the years to come, as would their many children, although only two, a son, Gokun, and a daughter, Shiko, are named. Of course, two years later, Fu Leng, thoroughly corrupted by the power of Jigoku, revealed himself to his siblings and declared war upon all of Rokugan. Unsurprisingly, given her close relationship to Fu Leng in the days before the fall from heaven, Shinjo was especially devastated by her brother's declaration of war. Desperate to avert the conflict and perhaps save Fu Leng, Shinjo tried to convince Hante, the first emperor, to let her go and meet him in the Shadowlands. After a furious argument, Hante eventually relented. But it was not to be. The legend has it that for love of her brother, Shinjo went to the Shadowlands, to Fulang's fortress in fact, and pleaded with him to change his mind. But the ninth kami spurned his sister's pleas. And so, war it was to be. There is really only one notable wartime anecdote concerning the Kirin clan prior to the Day of Thunder, and that was the attempt to form an alliance with the Yobanjin. The Yobanjin were small groups of nomadic pastoral tribesmen living just beyond the northern boundaries of the new Emerald Empire. In actuality, the Yobanjin were of the same race as the people of Rokugan. They looked the same and even spoke the same language, albeit in a more primitive dialect. Unlike their southern brothers, however, the Yobanjin never recognized the authority of Hante or of the Kami, calling themselves the Unbowed Tribes. When the war with Fu Leng began, Shinjo sent Ide and a young samurai named Shinjo Bairezu as an embassy to the Yobanjin, hoping to strike up an alliance with them in exchange for protecting the tribesmen from Fu Leng and his demonic hordes. However, the Yobanjin made it very clear that they were not interested in an alliance. They did this by shooting Ide and Bairezu's horses out from under them and then taking them captive before bringing them before their leader, Batul. The Yobanjin chieftain made it very clear to Ide and Bairezu that his people would never bend the knee to the empire and its fallen god rulers, and that any future messengers sent by Rokugan would be killed on sight. The war with Fu Leng was savage, and it ended only when Shinsei, the little sage, came to the Kami and asked for a champion from each of the great clans to fight Fu Leng and defeat him once and for all. No one challenged Shinjo's decision to put forward Otaku as the Kirin clan Thunder. This turned out to be especially fortuitous, as it was Otaku who convinced Isawa, the Phoenix Thunder, that instead of trying to kill Fu Lang, the best way to defeat the Mad God was to seal him away. This is in fact what Isawa would do on the Day of Thunder, while Otaku and the others fought the Mad God in order to buy the Shugenja the time to complete his spell. Otaku was among the first to die, impaled on Fu Lang's own sword, but defiant to the end, spitting in the ninth Kami's eyes before the life left her. But it was enough. Though mortally wounded, Isawa completed his spell. Fu Lang's essence was divided into twelve and sealed within the Black Scrolls, and thanks to the intervention and sacrifice of Shiba, Kami of the Phoenix Clan, Shinsei and Shosuro, the surviving Thunder, managed to escape with the Black Scrolls and end the war with Fu Lang. Ide grieved mightily for the death of his wife. 
This grief was doubled not long after by the loss of his son, Gokun. As Shinjo's chief diplomat, Ide had always believed that people should try to talk first in order to solve their problems, and that violence should only be used as a last resort. His son Gokun, however, rejected his father's more pacifistic view, seeing it as weak. Determined to avenge the death of his mother, Gokun chose to fight alongside the Crab Clan in the days following the war with Fu Lang, and was ultimately slain in battle, leaving behind a wife and daughter. Victory belonged to the people of Rokugan, but despite everything, Shinjo still loved her fallen brother Fu Lang and could find no joy in this triumph. Perhaps because of this, after the Day of Thunder, Shinjo approached Hante and told him of her intention to take what members of the Kirin clan would follow her and leave the Emerald Empire. Shinjo had always been curious and eager to explore. Perhaps out there, in the foreign lands beyond Rokugan, she might finally be able to reconcile herself with Fu Lang's fall and find peace. None of her siblings were pleased by this decision, but at last Hante relented. As a parting gift, he gave to his sister one of a pair of magical mirrors, supposedly crafted by Isawa before his death on the Day of Thunder. At noon, when the sun was at its height, the holders of the two mirrors could look into them and thus communicate with one another. This would serve as the Kirin clan's link to the Emerald Empire on their long journey. Doji also had a gift for her sister, but this was more personal and less practical. A small sandalwood fan bearing the crest of the Kirin clan on it. By this, she assured them, the Kirin clan would always be recognized by the people of the Emerald Empire, no matter how long they were gone. And so, in year 45 of the Empire, Shinjo assembled all the members of the Kirin clan and asked who among them would accompany her on her long journey beyond the lands of the Empire. Such was the loyalty of the Kirin clan vassals that the vast majority of them chose to accompany their divine founder into the unknown. Ide and his remaining children were the first to pledge their support, as well as a young man named Iyuchi, who had recently learned the arts of the Shugenja from the Phoenix clan during the war with Fu Lang. Because they were the first to do so, Shinjo would reward Ide and Iyuchi for their loyalty by elevating them to the rank of daimyo and allowing them to officially found their own samurai families. Shortly thereafter, Ide's daughter Shiko, a warrior maiden very much in the mold of her mother Otaku, asked and was granted by Shinjo the right to create her own family, which she named the Otaku family. And so, with its four primary families newly established, the Kirin clan left the Emerald Empire via the desert known as the Burning Sands and would not be seen again by any living soul for over 800 years. In the year 223 of the Empire, the blessed mirror that had been left with the emperors in Rokugan went dark, and it was believed by many that the Kirin clan was lost forever. Hante Genji, the reigning emperor at the time, established a new festival in memorial for the lost Kirin clan, celebrating their history and mourning their loss. Long centuries passed. Then, in the year 815, during the reign of Emperor Hante XII, Asako Matoya, daimyo of the Asako family, had a vision. A vision that foretold of the Kirin clan's return. But the Kirin clan had been declared extinct over 500 years ago and the people in her visions looked nothing like the Kirin clan. They didn't even look like samurai of Rokugan, and so Matoya dismissed the vision as merely a fanciful dream. Then, months later, Hiruma's scouts, reconnoitering in the Shadowlands, returned to the Crab clan reporting of a strange, purple-clad army moving northwards. Understandably wary and hostile towards anything that might come out of the Shadowlands, a land of cunning and deceptive demons, the Crab Clan readied itself for war, and attacked the strange army the instant they were in range of the Carpenter's Wall. Unable to counter the hail of missiles falling down upon them, the strange army began moving northwest. After all, even a structure as imposing as the Carpenter's Wall cannot go on forever. Of course, the Crab knew this, and when the strangers finally reached the northern edge of the Great Wall, they found the armies of the Crab ready to face them. Or at least, so the crab thought. You see, apart from the siege weapons of the Caillou clan used in defense of the Great Wall, 
Warfare in Rokugan is almost entirely on foot. Rokugani horses are just too small to carry men in full armor at this point, and apparently the Rokugani people had never even heard of the concept of a saddle. And the army that faced the crab that day was an army comprised entirely of cavalrymen. They rode horses that were larger, fiercer, and faster than anything the people of Rokugan had ever seen. And with that incredible speed on their side, the invaders smashed through the crab army and made it into the lands of the Empire. The invaders surged farther northward into the lands of the Scorpion Clan. The clan champion at the time, Bayushi Tanjaro, called upon the Lion and Phoenix Clans for aid, but he too underestimated the speed of the invaders, and the strange army managed to make it all the way north to Phoenix Lands when at last a representative of the Phoenix Clan was able to open up a parlay with them. The leader of the strange army called himself Shinjo Nishijin, champion of the Unicorn Clan, master of the Four Winds, descendant of Divine Shinjo, and that he and his clan had finally returned home. When word reached the Phoenix Clan, Asako Matoya became convinced that her vision had in fact been real, and with this, the Phoenix Clan was persuaded of Shinjo Nishijin's claims. With the intervention of the Phoenix Clan, Nishijin was able to gain an audience with the Emperor at Otosan Uchi. Naturally, all of the great leaders of Rokugan were present that day, including the leaders of the Crane Clan and their champion, Doji Ryobu. Upon recognizing the crest upon his kimono, Nishijin approached the Crane leader and gave him a small box. Inside the box was a small, worn sandalwood fan. Ryobu, cognizant of his clan's history, immediately recognized it as the same artifact that his ancestor, the Lady Doji, had given to Shinjo before the Kirin clan exodus. Now the Crane were fully convinced that the Unicorn were descended from the Kirin clan as they claimed. Unfortunately, both the Lion and Scorpion clans refused to believe that these strange barbaric-looking foreigners could be in any way related to the Kirin clan and their armies would continue to engage the forces of the Unicorn for several more days to come. The initial speed advantage that the Unicorn cavalry had was soon counteracted by their lack of knowledge of the local terrain and the inability to efficiently gather resources, turning the advantage firmly in the direction of the Lion and Scorpion armies. The Dragon, as was their habit, remained isolated in their mountains. As for the Crab Clan, as soon as they were assured that the Unicorn Clan was not some strange Shadowland army, they decided to wash their hands of what they saw as another frivolous political dispute and return south to the Wall and their vigil. With two clans for them, two against, and two abstaining, the position of the Unicorn Clan was looking increasingly precarious, especially as the Lion and Scorpion armies continued to press their advantage. Finally, a diplomat from the Unicorn Clan called Ide Suwari presented as a gift to the Emperor Hante XII two of the most magnificent steeds the Unicorn Clan possessed, and that gift finally tipped the scales. One year after the Unicorn Clan's arrival in the year 816, Hante XII formally recognized the Unicorn Clan as the descendants of the Kirin Clan and of the Kami Shinjo, and restored to them all of their old lands and territories. After their long exodus, the Kirin Clan, now the Unicorn Clan, had returned home but to a land they barely recognized, and a people that barely recognized them. The Unicorn had been gone for a long time, and had picked up many strange customs in many foreign lands. And this is what ultimately would define relations between the Unicorn and the other great clans of Rokugan. By far, the Unicorn Clan's strongest friendship is with the Crab Clan. After their return, the Unicorn Clan would tell stories of their long exodus, including the long journey they made through the Shadowlands in order to reach Rokugan. Tales of heroic strength and endurance are always a surefire way to the heart of a crab samurai. And unlike the other great clans, the Unicorn don't care about the crab's bluff and impolitic way of speaking. These, combined with their shared outsider status, means that the friendship between the Unicorn and Crab is arguably the strongest between any of the great clans of Rokugan. To the Unicorn, the Crab clan are great warriors, and unlike the other clans, they don't concern themselves with the strange foreign custom the Unicorn picked up in their long exodus. The Crab are willing to accept the Unicorn for what they are, and that is something that the Unicorn clan often isolated on account of the mistrust held towards them by everyone else, both remember and appreciate to this day. As for the Dragon Clan, the Unicorn really just don't know what to think of them. 
On the one hand, the Unicorn are grateful that the dragon's habitual isolation means they don't interfere with their own affairs. But the Unicorn also remember multiple times when the Dragon Clan might have intervened for the betterment of the Empire, but refused to do so. And that rankles them more than a little bit. The Unicorn have never really come into contact with the Phoenix Clan, given how far apart their lands are. The Phoenix are mostly friendly with the Unicorn, and the Unicorn Clan can certainly appreciate the great knowledge that the Phoenix Clan possess. And yet, the Unicorn also tend to find the Phoenix both overly idealistic and incredibly patronizing. The Unicorn know more about the world, particularly the world outside of the Emerald Empire, than anyone else, while the Phoenix Clan rarely leave their studies, let alone their territory in the Northeast. And yet, the Phoenix often act as if they know better than anyone, including the Unicorn. Still, these aren't really deal-breakers with the Unicorn, and they are more than willing to work alongside the Phoenix if they share a common goal. The Crane Clan are certainly friendly enough toward the Unicorn, but being the self-appointed guardians of Rokugani culture, the Crane are always trying to push the Unicorn to adopt more native Rokugan traditions and abandon many of the foreign ones they picked up along their exodus, and the Unicorn deeply resent that. Their experiences in the wider world and their great journey helped shape them to being what they are, and they're not willing to sacrifice their identity just to be accepted and liked by everyone else. Naturally, like all the other clans, the Unicorn dislike and mistrust the Scorpion, because, as I've said repeatedly now, nobody really likes the Scorpion. Which of course leaves the Lion Clan. Apart from the Scorpion, arguably the worst relationship the Unicorn have is with the Lion. And this comes from two sources. The first is a matter of their respective military traditions. The Lion Clan are the most purely samurai of all the great clans of Rokugan. And as the commanders of the Imperial Legions, they boast the greatest infantry in all of the Empire. The Unicorn, on the other hand, are almost entirely a cavalry clan. Nearly all of their fighting is done on horseback. This sharp military divide almost predisposes the two great clans to have a somewhat antagonistic relationship. The second source comes down to culture. The Crane might be the self-appointed guardians and proponents of Rokugan culture and court etiquette, but the Lion are arguably the greatest sticklers for tradition, particularly the Code of Bushido and the veneration of the ancestors. The Unicorn have a strong sense of morality and justice, and while they don't discount honor like the Scorpion Clan does, like the Crab, they take a pragmatic view of doing the right thing, and to their mind, if the Code of Bushido stands in the way of doing what's right, then they will happily ignore it. This of course means that the Lion view them as being dishonorable at times, while the Unicorn view their eastern neighbors as stuffy and overbearing. There's also the fact that the Lion, much like the Crane, are the most vocal in viewing the Unicorn's foreign traditions with distrust. And unlike the Crane, the Lion are unwilling or unable to hide that mistrust. Now what is it about the Unicorn Clan that make them so foreign to the others? To explain that, you have to understand the families that comprise the Unicorn Clan. First, the Ide family. The philosophy of the Ide family is that when you've resorted to violence, you've already lost. For them, diplomacy and negotiation are the best tools one can use when dealing with other people. As their founder, Ide was the voice of Shinjo and the Kirin clan during their long exile, serving as her representative to any of the cultures and civilizations that they encountered on their journeys, the Ide clan, upon their return to Rokugan, became the courtier family of the Unicorn. Because they often had to negotiate with strange peoples in strange lands, the Ide are expert linguists, and most of them often speak more than one language. Necessity often forced the Ide to adapt in their negotiation with other cultures, making them incredibly flexible when dealing with other people. And this quality makes them arguably the best diplomats in all of Rokugan, something that no doubt annoys the Crane Clan to no end. The Ide family are perhaps the most comfortable with adapting to the Rokugani way of life, but that doesn't mean they've entirely discounted the heritage they've acquired over their long wanderings. While not as famed or as beautiful as the gardens of the Crane, the Ide cultivate their own gardens, filled with beautiful plants they've collected in their long journey outside of the Empire. In sharp contrast to the Ide, the Otaku family are very much a warrior family to the core. To this day, the family venerates its founder, the original Otaku, 
and their crest is simply a field of purple, representing her purity and her silence. Despite this, it was Otaku's daughter, Otaku Shiko, that established most of the Otaku family's traditions. Like the Lion Clan's Matsu family, the Otaku are a matriarchal family, and men are expressly forbidden from holding the rank of daimyo. But unlike the Matsu family, where both men and women fight alongside one another in battle, the roles of men and women within the Otaku family are strictly segregated. The Otaku cavalry forms the core of the Unicorn Clan's military might. But in the family, only women are permitted to actually ride those horses in battle, including the Otaku Battle Maidens, the most elite unit of the family and the clan as a whole. The role of men within the Otaku family is the care, training, and breeding of the Otaku steeds. It's no exaggeration to say that otaku men are the greatest horse breeders in all of the Emerald Empire. And in fact, the two horses that were gifted to Hante the Twelfth, the gift that ultimately convinced him to recognize the Unicorn Clan, were otaku-bred stallions. To this day, to be given an otaku steed is a rare honor, a gift usually reserved only for the emperor or the heads of the great clans. The Shinjo are of course the clan's ruling family. They too are a warrior family, but they don't have quite the same reputation as the otaku. Like the otaku, the Shinjo breed horses, but theirs are considered of lesser quality to the otaku steeds. But that's not much of a mark against them, as a Shinjo steed is to an ordinary horse what an ordinary horse is to a dog. It's just that otaku horses are even better. More than anything, the Shinjo embody the heart and soul of the unicorn clan. The Shinjo are essentially the moral and ideological heart of the clan. In life, Lady Shinjo was always a great explorer, always curious to see what lay beyond the horizon, and her children retained that love of freedom and exploration to this day. The Shinjo family are not as married to the concept of Bushido as the families of the Lion Clan, but they have a strong sense of right and wrong, and believe that fairness in all things is the highest ideal, whether in combat or elsewhere. But if we're talking about the Unicorn as a clan influenced by foreign customs, there are no better examples of that influence than the Iyuchi and Moto families. The Iyuchi are the Unicorn clan's Shugenja family. And unsurprisingly, given 800 years of wandering and encounters with foreign peoples, the Iyuchi have also picked up foreign concepts of magic. And this leads us to arguably the biggest reason why the other clans, particularly the Phoenix in this case, hold the Unicorn Clan at arm's length, Mei Shodo. Now, the way that magic normally works in Legend of the Five Rings is that a Shugenja will write the incantation down on a piece of paper, an Ofuda. The spell essentially serves as an invocation, calling upon a spirit of at least one of the five elements, fire, earth, air, water, and void. The Shugenja then recites the incantation, summoning the spirit and channeling its power to use the spell. To use Mei Shodo, as the Iyuchi family does, is to perform magic without calling upon the spirits. Mei Shodo mostly revolves around the creation of magic items, that is, small trinkets or fetishes with a spell bound into it. The way this works is that the Mei Shodo user holds the trinket and then wills the spell bound within to activate. This gives Mei Shodo the advantage of being much faster than traditional Shugenja magic, as it doesn't require any lengthy incantation. However, it does have two disadvantages. The first is that while a Shugenja can perform spells without the Ofuda, assuming they've memorized the spell, a Mei Shodo user needs to have the magic item on their person in order to use it. Secondly, Shugenja magic is far more flexible. For example, a powerful Shugenja can alter a healing spell so that it might help more than one person. By contrast, once a magical item is created for Mei Shodo, the spell cannot be modified or altered. Of course, the fact that Mei Shodo does not invoke the spirits flies in the face of the Tao of Shinsei, which is not only the basis for Shugenja magic, but also one of the major religions of Rokugan. Because of this, many people, especially Shugenja families, tend to regard the Unicorn Clan with suspicion, with some hardliners in the Phoenix Clan regarding Mei Shodo as an act of blasphemy. Still, even if the Iyuchi wanted to, they really can't afford to stop using Mei Shodo. Shortly after the Unicorn Clan's return, the Iyuchi family discovered that despite their best efforts to adapt Mei Shodo to traditional Rokugani magic systems, 
they found themselves completely cut off from the source of magical energy that the spirits could provide. Naturally, the Iyuchi family has done its best to keep this little fact a secret, not only from the other great clans, but from the other families of the Unicorn as well. And then there is the Moto family. You might have noticed that unlike the other four, the Moto family did not exist when the Kirin began their exodus 800 years ago. To the west, the lands of the Unicorn are bounded by a desert known as the Burning Sands. On the other side of that desert lived tribes of pastoral nomads called the Ujikai, essentially Legend of the Five Rings take on the Mongols. One day, the Ujikai looked up and saw what looked like an army of weary purple-clad strangers coming out of the desert and saw easy marks. However, despite being tired and dehydrated, Shinjo and the Kirin clan managed to defeat the Ujikai and press them into service as native guides. However, as time passed and the two cultures got to know one another on the long journey, relations softened, and Shinjo's strength and honor so impressed the Ujikai that one of its leaders, Moto, was the first to pledge his loyalty to her. The Moto family was the biggest cultural influence on the Unicorn Clan, particularly in terms of their Central Asian clothing and their horseback riding techniques. It was the Moto, after all, who first introduced the Unicorn Clan to the saddle and bridle. While the Shinjo and Otaku families would become the mainstay of the Unicorn Clan cavalry, the Moto became the elite shock troops, rigorously drilled to make concerted charges into the enemy's flanks. In turn, the Moto also adopted some of the customs and principles of the Rokugani, but of all the Unicorn families, they have perhaps the most lax attitude towards Bushido and honor in warfare. In that way, at least, they are still the barbarian tribesmen that they always were and are feared for their ruthlessness and savagery in battle. Even to this day, the leader of the Moto family holds the title of Khan rather than Daimyo, a remnant of the days before they swore allegiance to Shinjo and her descendants. Perhaps the biggest change made by the Moto family when they joined the Unicorn Clan was the adoption of the Rokugani worship of the fortunes and the abandonment of their old gods, the Lords of Death. Also known as the Shi Tian Yan Wang, the Lords of Death were grim, ruthless gods who granted their worshippers power in exchange for sacrifice and reverence. Abandoned by the Ujikai when they became the Moto family and formally joined the Unicorn, the Lords of Death were determined to take their revenge on their wayward followers, a revenge that would not see fulfillment until after the Unicorn Clan's return to Rokugan. When the Moto family originally became part of the Unicorn Clan, their symbol was that of the Red Chrysanthemum, symbolizing the Moto family's optimism and new beginning. After the Unicorn Clan's return to Rokugan, the reigning Khan of the Moto family, Moto Tsume, was informed of the danger posed to the Empire by the Shadowlands. According to legend, Tsume was subtly influenced by the Lords of Death, the gods his people had long abandoned, and vowed that he would destroy the Shadowlands once and for all. In the year 825, Moto Tsume let the bulk of his fighting men into the Shadowlands to help the Crab Clan. No one knows exactly what happened, but only a scant few of the warriors that rode with Moto Tsume returned, their hair gone white, their hearts gone cold, and their eyes filled with fear. All died within five years of their return. Later, it was revealed that the bulk of the Moto warriors that had ridden into the Shadowlands, including their Khan, Tsume, had succumbed to the taint and joined the Lost, eventually even becoming undead zombies, the so-called Dark Moto. This revelation so horrified the Moto family that they changed their crest from the red hopeful chrysanthemum to a stylized death mask. And to this day, many Moto warriors who ride into battle paint their faces white in imitation of their family crest. Perhaps as a grim jest at the expense of their untainted brethren, the Dark Moto soon adopted their own crest, a death mask with inverted colors and a sinister grin. As for the fallen Khan, Moto Tsume, he would lead the Dark Moto for centuries to come, leading frequent attacks on the lands of the Crab Clan and his former Unicorn Brethren. That is the Unicorn Clan, a clan long exiled from its home, now returned, often treated with suspicion by its neighbors. They both want to be accepted, but are also determined to hold on to their own traditions and the experiences and legacy that has made them who they are. 
As for their founder, the Lady Shinjo herself, she disappeared long ago during the Exodus, in a battle with what was later revealed to be the forces of the Lying Darkness. With all the other great clans, the death or disappearance of their founding Kami is seen as a great loss and tragedy. With the Unicorn, it's slightly different, because before that battle, Shinjo had promised the Unicorn that she would always return to them. And even though many centuries have passed since then, the Unicorn Clan have always kept the faith. Until the day that their divine founder returns, the Unicorn ride on, proud, defiant, and courageous to the last.